Hello. So, as a kid, I was pretty afraid. I wasn't really one of the cool kids, and uh, I had a big interest in children's books, and I was more interested in that, I think, than playing with the unknown kids in the neighborhood. Diving into the world of imagination, but instead of reading the books, I was browsing through them, making up stories on my own. Uh, I also loved drawing and making up my own ideas, and I dreamt about another place, but not a place that exists, but one that doesn't. I think the first 10 years of your life defines you as a person. I think that maybe fear defined me. I think fear is something, it's similar to storytelling, but in your head. It often made me imagine the worst scenarios possible, but it also made me imagine other things. We had computers at home pretty early, and that opened up my eyes to the digital world. And as, my, as I got my first digital camera on my 15th birthday, it was a natural step for me to start manipulating photographs. It was the first time that I realized that I could combine my two interests of drawing and computers. And to me, it felt strange to just capture a photograph, to press the trigger and be done. So I wanted to capture something more, something where pressing the trigger is only the start. So just like drawing, where you start with a white piece of paper, the camera became my brush and Photoshop my canvas. But why would fear be part of creativity? At first, it didn't really seem like it had affected me at all. But as I started to think a little bit more about it, I felt like maybe I haven't, wouldn't even have created these images without fear. So I would like to take you through my creative process, where fear has not only been an obstacle, but also a tool. And I would like to talk about a few fears that has affected me as an artist. Uh, and I would like to talk about my process on how I create my images from idea to shooting to final image. And in the end, I would like to give you an example and give you a look into one of my files. Um, so, starting with the fear of failure. I think it's something that we can all recognize. And uh, to me, it has to do with how I got into this in the first place. Doing Photoshop or illustration for a living didn't really feel like a real job. Um, I didn't get any support from my family or school to, to pursue that, so uh, as I, they encouraged me to create, but it wasn't something you can really do for a living. So instead of following my dream of uh, illustration, I went for my other interest, which was computers, and started studying computer engineering. But during this time, I picked up photography and retouching once more. And at this point, I knew the basics, and I thought that I could give a more complex kind of photo manipulation a try, where you spend weeks or months on just one single image. So when I finished my studies, I thought that I could give freelancing a try. I feared that I would fail, but the only thing I feared more was regret to not have tried. And having no experience on how things were meant to be done, I learned by trying. I had no idea that on a big photo shoot, you're most probably not alone. There are assistants and set builders and art directors and all kinds of people who do things. But I started by doing it all by myself with simple tools, home-built models, and friends for models. I feared that I would fail, so I worked very hard on making these images. Uh, I did the commission work that I could find and the personal work in between. But most importantly, I always kept busy. If I didn't have any assignments, I made up my own. Uh, and I realized that no matter what field you're in, there seemed to be no shortcuts, really. It hasn't really been a straight road. And learning by trying is not always the fastest road. And it's definitely a road of many failures. By learning by trying, you get familiar with the tools, you discover both the possibilities and the limitations, I think that will help you realize what is possible and what is not. Because for every product, I was afraid of failure. And sometimes it did fail. Um, 
but there was always another way around, yeah. uh, even if a product failed, and that is how I learned. I think it's natural to have a fear of failure. It's something that is built into us, but it's not something that we should avoid. It's just part of the process of becoming better. So don't hesitate, fail over and over again, and you'll learn something every time. The worst is not failure, but the worst is to not have tried. It's just on a, bump, a bump on the road on the, on the way to success, so don't look back, look ahead. Another thing I think about is um, it does require some imagination to create these images, and I do fear losing that inspiration, running out of ideas, and especially when you do that for a living. So to me, inspiration is something I think they can come at any time, but I always try to sketch down even the smallest ideas. I think coming up with ideas is also sometimes about setting up limits. I think to be able to think outside the box, uh, there sometimes need to be a box first. And I think it's a good way to point uh, creativity in the right direction, to set up limits. And to me, those limits can be that I have to shoot everything myself, uh, that I have to use the environments around me, um, but it can also be a theme or topic, something that I want to create an image around. And I'll go into that a little bit more a bit later. Uh, I think a lot of ideas never really get realized, and that is okay. I always save it for the future, and I find that my own sketchbooks can be of great inspiration when inspiration is running low. Because I think the best lesson of this is that no one be, can be creative all the time. And if I force myself, it can almost have the opposite effect. I think it's just better to do something completely different, like doing sports or, or, or taking a walk or just doing something completely different. I think ideas should be allowed to take time so you can keep them with, me, uh, with you in your mind, let them grow, and come back to them later. Because inspiration will run out, and that is okay. So don't chase it. Open your mind, and the ideas will come to you instead. The third thing is about the fear of a too big project. And that can be, I think, in a way, that's the biggest fear, uh, and the one that I struggle with the most. And that can be technical difficultness, that you're unfamiliar with the tools, or how to create or capture something. Afraid that it's too hard or complicated, or that the task ahead is too hard to grasp. And how do you even start? As a result, I often put it on hold to do it someday instead. But someday isn't really a day. I think that starting is the most difficult part of the process. I waited so many times to find a perfect place, but sometimes there isn't really a perfect place, and you have to create that place instead. You don't really learn unless you try. I think that to be able to achieve quality, you need quantity first. To build up a body of work that you can throw away as you become better. It's something that I've been doing for years, and I will continue to do so. I only show my best work, and that is something that is con constantly changing. Not every new product can be the best, and that is okay. At least you learn something along the way. I think it's not really that much that I, I use from studying engineering today uh, that I took with me. But one thing that I did learn is problem solving. And I think to capture something that doesn't exist is a problem. But every problem can be broken down into smaller problems. And I think that seeing the big picture is one thing. But seeing the small is how you make it come to life. So I think that that's the best answer to the fear of a two-week product problem solving, to trying to figure out how to capture the impossible. And that leads me into the second part of this presentation, which is more about the process and how I create something. And I think it is connected, because it's about how you solve something is how you break it down and solve all the little parts of the process. Um, so I would like to show this a little bit more, how it works in practice. When I started, I didn't really know how I could get there. It was it felt like a big obstacle on the road between the idea and the final product, how I could actually create something. 
I also wanted it to look realistic because I wanted people to be able to relate to the picture and feel like that they are part of it somehow. So I followed the pretty simple three-step process of creating my images, and it's always the same. And I thought that I could talk a bit more of each step of it. It always starts with planning, coming up with an idea, finding locations where you can actually shoot something. Second part of the pro process is photographing or collecting the material. And the third one is Photoshop, the fun part. We're combining the pieces of the puzzle. I think it usually starts with just a fun idea. But I carefully select the ideas that I find most interesting. And not just visually, but the ones that can somehow tell a story as well. I think it's good to let it take time, come back to it, and improve it. Um, I think it's pretty individu individual how we come up with ideas, but this is the way I think about it. I like to start simple with a combination between two regular things, but in an unexpected way. Making a connection between things that normally don't have a connection, but somehow still have something in common. I like to start simple and then develop over time, because an idea is not born in a moment, but it always starts with a, with a simple thought. And I thought I could show you by just, let's see if we can, by just showing you how it can actually look like. Don't worry, I'm an engineer, so <laughs> I think I can make this work. All right, that's my pen. So, all right. Um, so just an, as an example to show you like how how it can usually start with something. So I had this idea about, uh, I, was, I was editing one of my behind the scenes videos and I was looking at the audio track and I kind of thought that it kind of actually looks like, okay, my drawing skills are normally better. Well, let's see, I'm not so used to drawing on a tablet. But I think that it does look like somehow like, uh, like a forest, doesn't it? A forest that is reflected in a lake. When you look at it just like this, and I thought, maybe I can do a picture of that. That's kind of like interesting uh, transformation between a forest and a soundtrack. So then I thought about my sister just bought an old gramophone player uh, on a vintage market. And I thought, maybe I can use that for something. Maybe the sound can actually come out of that. So I think coming up with ideas is a lot about asking questions and trying to figure out how I can actually make it come to life. So let's see, something like this. So I kind of started sketching, making some ideas. I thought that I can make a player like this. Maybe there's a record. Maybe there's some other records lying around. What is actually happening in the scene? I'm trying to get back to it and try to ask, ask myself, how can I make this look interesting? I think when a picture or an idea starts to make questions like this, why is this happening? Or maybe there's a person coming over here with another record. Or, what is actually happening? Uh, what is happening when you change the record? Would that show, would there be some other kind of landscape coming out of it then? Or, so an idea can usually start with something as simple as this, just thinking about a soundtrack that it actually looks like a forest. And that became that picture later. So there are some steps in between, <laughs> like this and this. But I wanted to show you that it's kind of like, you know, it's, that's how it starts. It's just some Photoshop in between and, you know, Apply the layers. Um, yeah, let's see. And this one, uh, so I also wanted to show you that I do like perspective illusions and trying playing around with perspective sometimes. And I had this idea about doing something with a cube. I think cubes are pretty fascinating because they are kind of like, if you look at it like this, you can kind of imagine that you're both looking up in a corner in, in like the ceiling kind of, or you can also look down on a cube that, that goes in and out at the same time. I thought I could do something interesting with this. It kind of looks like a room, and maybe I can do a room that's inside and outside at the same time. So I started with a, with a cube like this, and I started drawing a little bit. Like I thought maybe there can be a lamp up here. Maybe there's like this is actually inside. There's some like, and somehow you're looking up in the in the ceiling, but at the same time it's kind of outside. Maybe a person is standing here next to it somehow and trying to get in. Kind of didn't really come together nicely like I wanted it to, so I actually turned the cube around and did it like this instead. And I kind of thought that, yeah, maybe this can actually, maybe then a person can be standing here instead. You can do some like door or something that's like window. And actually, it goes pretty well with doing a, 
roof here, and yeah, kind of started to come together. And uh, I started to ask myself, what is this dude actually doing in here? So maybe since it's a house, maybe he's an architect, maybe he's working on something, maybe this is actually an idea, maybe he's kind of working inside his head somehow. And it created this image later. So it usually just starts with a really simple idea, and I'll talk about the next steps in a bit so you know how to get there. Um, but uh, I think we can switch back for now. Where did I put the clicker? Um, I think it's usually it just starts with a con connection between two unexpected things, so two regular things that kind of have something in common. So for example, guitar strings and power lines kind of look similar. Guitar, electric guitar, and power lines carry electricity. So it created this image. Um, I kind of thought that it could be interesting to do something with a landscape that kind of behaves like paper somehow. Maybe it can open up along the dotted line that you have in the road. I did some experiments, and it resulted in this picture. So I, an idea usually starts with just making connections between things. The second step of the uh, process is photographing. And to me, photography is more about just capturing the material I need to create my picture. I have a lot of weird ideas, but I think the biggest challenge is always to make it look realistic. I want it to look like a snapshot from another world. Uh, and I think the trick to make it look like that is to capture as much as possible in camera. Because no one can tell you that it doesn't look realistic if it was actually captured. So I thought I could show you an example of that um, in a bit. Because first I wanted to say <laughs> that uh, it's often materials from many different locations. I never really use stock photos in my personal work. Um, and I always shoot new material for the image I'm about to create, not to have to compromise with quality. Um, because I think if something is almost good, it's not really good enough. So to show you an example of how I try to capture as much as possible in camera, I had this idea about boats being set free from their paintings. And uh, I had this idea about like water for coming out of the painting, and the boats are just floating away. And I thought water is kind of tricky to work with, because it's transparent, and it distorts what's behind it. Uh, so I thought the best way to do that would be to actually be able to pour water out of a painting. So I just built a simple container out of cardboard and plastic that I could actually fill up with water. I put a flash in the, in the top of the container with a radio trigger, and I could actually fill it up with water and pour it out of it. So as you can see, this looks pretty similar to the, to the result. What I did was mainly to remove the parts that are visible of the container and uh, put the boats in there and give it a little bit different touch in Photoshop, and it looks like this. So it doesn't always have to be a lot of different idea, uh, parts that really then in complex combinations become something. It can sometimes just be as simple as making a container that you can fill up with water and pouring it out. For this project, uh, I bought 17 square meters of mirror and brought it out together with a boat and a model in a stone pit and put it out and photographed it. I had this idea about making a lake break up like a mirror, and I thought that would be a good idea to do it that way. Um, and you might ask yourself, why do you do that? Because like a reflection, a mirror is basically just a reflection of what you see in it, right? Uh, so wouldn't it be enough to just have the mirrors, I think, <laughs> mirrors here in this area? Uh, but Well, maybe it would, but I think that the realism is often in the details. And when you start to look closely, there's a lot of things going on that is kind of hard to fake. And, and if you do capture it, you don't really have to fake it. So I think it's always good to try to capture as much as you can in camera. And then you take it, take it even one more step in Photoshop. There are a lot of things that can be changed in Photoshop. But there are two things that I think are the most important things to consider when you want to capture the material. And that is, the first thing is perspective. So I had this idea about putting a house on a cliff, like far away from everything else, like an end station somehow. 
And I had this nice view of this building from my window, and I thought that it would be perfect for that, uh, for that idea. So I photographed it. Um, I draw out the perspective lines, and from that I could sketch up where I needed to shoot all the different other materials. And uh, I think it's like kind of basic, simple thing, but I think it's very important to consider. There are tools in Photoshop such as uh, Perspective Warp to change uh, perspective of things, but uh, I think it mainly works for very boxy objects. And even if a house looks boxy, it's not really boxy. It still has things going out from it. Um, the second thing to think about when, oh right, I can show you what it actually looks like. This is what it looked like in the end. Um, so the bridge is, bridge is from one place, the mountain is from another place, the, the people are from another place, the bench is from one place. So like, it's all about combining all these different pieces into one single image. And then it's very important that the perspective is consistent throughout the different parts. The second thing to think about is light. And it's like two main things to think about, and that is direction and size. But also, so how big is the light source and where is it coming from? But also that even a hard shadow becomes softer further away from the object, and a shadow is usually darker underneath an object, and if there's another object close by that can also interact with that. Um, but I think, to me, natural light is the most important thing. I, I, I always want to look realistic, and then I think the light needs to look, realist, uh, look natural. I do use studio light sometimes, but only in a way that it kind of makes sense. Because I think that light needs to have a purpose, that there's a reason for the light to be there. The third part of the process is the fun part, putting it together in Photoshop. I think that Photoshop is a very powerful tool because it's something that is used from beginners to professionals, anything from birthday invitations to these pictures. And I learned it by trying for the past 16 years, and I still learn while I do it today. I think there are many tutorials on how to do specific things, but the way I think about it is that it always looks better if you capture it for real, but then you can take it another step in Photoshop. And to me, Photoshop is a tool to make the transition between my material seamless. I'm not going into too much detail on how exactly I do uh, all the different things, because we don't really have time for it. But it's mainly about separating the thing, the different objects, uh, masking and adjusting. I first put it together very roughly, and then I start to fine tune the different parts to make it look better and better. I always work in a non-destructive way to keep all the layers, because I don't see a reason not to. Uh, and I think with good material, it can be a pretty straightforward process. It usually takes a couple of days to put it together, but I usually stretch it into months, because I think it's better to let it rest for a while and see it with new eyes. And I always ask myself, what would this look like if it would have been photographed? And to show you how it can look like, I want to show you one of my pieces. So this is an idea where I wanted a landscape to melt down like a waterfall. And so I started I, with a sketch, and then I found a landscape that I thought would be perfect for this. I photographed it from a high perspective. Then I built a model out of cardboard um, that I covered with paper. And then I did a mixture of flour water, food coloring, and coconut flakes that I applied to the model. And I photographed it with the light coming from the same direction and in the same perspective. I ran out of green food coloring, so <laughs> I don't know, Kevin, if you notice. <laughs> but, but, it's, uh, but, but since perspective and light is the most important thing to, uh, to be able to change, uh, color is something that you can change in Photoshop pretty easily. I photographed the building since it was far, from far distance. It's still a pretty boxy object, so I can actually transform it to make it fit the perspective of the scene. I put in the different parts like this. I put in the liquid, the grass, the... I photographed a little tree that I put in there. All the different parts, separate layers. I photographed some mountains. I put, it, put in the house there. This, the roof, the water wheel, covered it with textures. Um, and finally, it looks like something like this. 
So you don't really need advanced equipment to create these images. It's more about the idea. I think it's great to create stuff in reality and just get away from the screen can be inspirational. And I think it looks more realistic and it's more fun. And I think in the end, it's all about problem solving. So when you're done with a the picture, there's one last thing that I kind of fear, and that is the fear of expectations or fear of feedback. When done with a picture, I always look for feedback because I think that's when I've been working with some, something for such a long time, I think it's actually hard to see it with new eyes and see what's actually good or bad. I think honest feedback is something that can be pretty hard, but I always take it in and listen, and then I let, try to decide for myself. I think everyone does have a different taste, and you can't make everyone happy. Then you will fail to be true to yourself, and the result won't really be good. So don't let fear of expectations take over. Follow your heart and put your own touch in your work, whether it is personal or commission work. With that said, I thought that I could actually show you also the Photoshop file, since how it actually can be built up. So since we talked about this earlier, I thought that it could be a good idea to show you the architect. So creating a picture like this, um, where you have a perspective illusion, all lines in each direction needs to be parallel to get the double perspective of going up and down at the same time. So I followed the guide like this, where I put in all the different parts. Um, and what I started with was basically to photograph the house. Let's see, I can do it like this. Uh, so I started with the house, started with the floor, started with the different parts. It's a lot of different, every different part, every window, every little sketch, every little thing has its own uh, layer, but we don't really have time to get into that now. It's kind of complex here, let's see. Uh, start to come together slowly. I photographed the model sitting here, have it all like smart objects, all divided into different parts. Photographed him building up a similar scene, so I would kind of know what it would actually look like. Photo photographed him from a far distance, put a light here, because I thought that there would be a little light in his little office here. Um, cut him out, put him in there. I photographed the scene, the, the surroundings, with, also with the light, so that it would actually cast some light on the surrounding grass and get the same. All right, let's see. I hope it kind of makes sense. <laughs> uh, and then finally put the final effects on there to make it all come together. And I think what I talked about before, that it's also about the details. So when you look at it closely, even though most people will never see this, I spend a couple of hours just doing all these sketches to kind of make it feel realistic, even though I don't know if this actually makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, but if you would take a closer look. So I think that's about we have time to do there. So how can I lose the clicker? Lastly, what I just wanted to say is I think that fear is something that is natural. It's something that we're born with. I think to, become, to develop and become better, we sometimes have to face those fears. Fear is also part of the process of becoming better, and we sometimes have to do something different and get out of our comfort zones. But there's not really anything to fear. So go create, free your mind, and let that be the limit. Because there is no limit. Thank you. Eric, I'm, I'm just blown away by your work and I'm, I think like everyone here, so honoured that you 
came down to join us. People online are making comments like, I'm witnessing creative genius. Um, I mean, your work is just phenomenal. You've, um, Eric's got to arguably be the most famous Photoshop artist in the entire world. And when we asked him to come down here to Australia, it was just, nothing has been a problem. Say, so, yeah, I'd love to come down. What can I do? How can I help? What? Um, Seriously, it's been, you've, it's just been an honor working with you. La ladies and gentlemen, please again, thank Eric Johansson. Thank you for having me.